All right. So Carl will be speaking to us today on uh, essential software requirements. Um, there are lots of big books on them. He wrote a big one at the beginning, and then he has a much smaller one now that gives you the 20 core requirements activities so you don't have to read the big giant ones. Um, and so he's here tonight to talk to um, some of those core practices and drill down into them. Um, so these are the ones that you really need to focus on in the world of so many other things. Um, and your projects will be successful um, if you uh, follow the guidance here. For those of you that don't know Carl, he's a principal consultant with Process Impact, and he's the author of 14 books, um, including the Software Requirements Essentials that just came out, as well as Software Development Pearls, and um, The Thoughtless Design of Everyday Things, which if you don't have that book, that is great and a really funny read. Um, and he also um, dabbles in um, forensic mystery novel, novels, and um, he's always posting on LinkedIn. So if you're not following him on LinkedIn, you should, because he's just always dropping little pearls of wisdom everywhere. Um, and um, if you go to his website, you can also hear some of his original songs that he's recorded. So I'll turn it over to Carl now. Okay, well, thanks very much, Jennifer. Let me... Uh... Get my screen up here. And hopefully that was successful. You can uh, all see that. Um, I'm gonna get that back up. All right. So uh, thanks very much. Appreciate the introduction. It's good to hear what all the other chapters are doing. And I really appreciate all of the chapters participating in this mass event. Uh, I think it's a lot more fun to have people from different parts of the universe coming together for these sorts of things. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, I've been interested for a long time in helping software teams improve how they deal with their requirements. Uh, when I was a software developer at Kodak in mid 1980s, my team came up with the product champion model for working with customer representatives. We started prototyping, we adopted a nice structured template for software requirement specification. We began drawing analysis models and those sorts of things. And we found all these techniques were really valuable and, and really helped us. So this interest eventually, as Jennifer pointed out, uh, led me to writing several books on requirements and doing a lot of training and consulting in this area. And by looking over other people's shoulders in that way, which is one of the fun things about being a consultant and a trainer, you see what a lot of people are doing and see what works well and what doesn't. But I was able to observe some patterns of approaches that did work well and those that didn't do so well. Um, Jennifer was waving around uh, the second edition of my software requirements book and the third edition that came out about 10 years ago was nearly 650 pages long. That was a really seriously big book. But it turns out busy business analysts and product owners and product managers and requirements engineers, they might not have the time to read a great big book. And there are a lot of books out there on business analysis and requirements that are pretty hefty. So I realized that I could distill down, and I like the idea of distilling, having been a chemist in a former life, uh, distill down these dozens of requirements practices, all of which are valuable in the right situation, into a core set of 20 practices that I think pretty much every project should consider performing. So Candace Hokanson and I recently wrote this much shorter book, Software Requirements Essentials. And I might mention that Jennifer was one of our manuscript reviewers for that. So she's pretty familiar with this material. And uh, I, I really appreciated all of the input she provided. And we had some really uh, enlightening discussions as well. So thanks to Jennifer for her contributions to this book. You'll find her name there in the acknowledgments. So one important point is that these practices apply regardless of the kind of product you're building, regardless of the kind of development life cycle you're following or the kind of team culture you have. So today I wanna to tell you about those 20 practices that I think are essential to be a success. Now, as we go along, I would invite you to ask yourself to think about the extent to which each of these practices applies to your situation and look for ways that you could apply that practice, perhaps with some adjustment, uh, and look for ways to redo, improve your requirements to reduce your project risk with these techniques. Um, I also want to point out on the slide here 
Uh, and Jennifer just put it up, the uh, URL for the website for this book, uh, softwarerex.com. There you can read a bunch of reviews of the book. You can see some videos. In fact, I just recently launched a uh, video series I'm calling The One Minute Analyst on YouTube, and you can get to it from softwarerex.com, where I'm putting out once a week, just a very short, like about a minute long video on one of these topics. And also you can download uh, a bunch of useful checklists, templates, spreadsheet tools, and that kind of stuff from the webpage. So that might be worth checking out. So I'm going to get started here. And what I'm going to do is turn off my camera, if I can uh, make that happen. Okay, so let's turn off the camera. Uh, you got to love how Zoom has these little drop downs and then they go away if you don't do something for a, a couple of seconds, which I've never understood. So hopefully you can't see me, but you can still hear me. So these 20 practices are grouped into six categories. First are five practices that lay a solid foundation for project success. And the other practices are grouped into the five subdivisions of requirements engineering. There are four core practices on requirements elicitation, followed by four more on requirements analysis, another four on specification, one on validating requirements, and finally two critical requirements management practices. And of course, these are by no means the only techniques that a skilled BA should have in their toolkit. Um, I think the biggest list I've seen was uh, over 100 practices in one book on business analysis, and they're all valuable, but I think these are really the mo 20 most important ones. In this short presentation, I can't um, talk about all of them in detail, but I'll show you all of the practices in each category, and then I will drill down into one of them in each category. Now, when I say requirements here, I'm referring to whatever kind of objects your project uses to represent information about stakeholder needs and to describe a solution's capabilities and characteristics. So these kinds of knowledge encompass a lot of different sorts of stuff, business requirements, user requirements, stakeholder requirements, although that's a term I don't use, um, functional and non-functional requirements, use cases, user stories, and so forth. So let's not get hung up on the terminology, uh, but whatever quantum of things that you use that you uh, see fitting into this requirements category, that's what I'm talking about. So if you need to do a mental global replace of my words about requirements with some other words, fine, go ahead and do that. But we're still talking about the same kinds of information. So how do we lay the foundation for success? Starting with the notion that every project has requirements, whether they're stated or not, whether they're carefully considered or not, whether they're documented in some form or not. And a good set of requirements lets you answer some important and universal questions like these. Why are we working on this project at all? What are we trying to build? Who are we trying to satisfy? What kinds of parts do we implement first? And then after that, and then maybe never, some of them might never make it into the solution. How can we tell if our solution is good enough? And something people should always be interested in is how do we know when we're done, either with a particular development increment or with the product as a whole? So if someone asked you these questions about your project, would you be able to give good answers? I hope so. It's hard for me to think of any kind of a project or team or group of stakeholders that wouldn't find the answers to these questions helpful. So there are several actions you can take early in some initiative to try to get the information that lets you answer these kinds of questions. That understanding lays a foundation for a successful project. It ensures that the team addresses the right problem. It aligns everyone toward common objectives. It makes sure they engage the right participants and it keeps the team's efforts focused. Those all sound like good, important things to me that apply pretty much everywhere. So these are the five practices that we recommend to help all projects build this solid foundation for success. Have you ever seen a project that built and delivered a solution only to discover that they were solving the wrong problem? Organizations launch initiatives to solve a business problem or maybe exploit an opportunity However, sometimes those problems or opportunities are not explicitly stated or documented. 
So it's important to understand the problem before converging on a solution. I suggest that you don't presume that either a presented problem or a proposed solution is necessarily correct. Instead, it's a good idea to do some root cause analysis to make sure the problem is well understood and that a proposed solution does make sense. The stakeholders need to understand why this initiative is being launched and its business objectives. I'll talk more about this shortly. Now, when you launch a new initiative, you might not know just where to draw the line between what the solution should and should not include. So an important foundational practice is to establish that what's in, what's out boundary. It's a solution scoping action. Every project has stakeholders who are individuals or groups who are actively involved in a project or are affected by the project or can influence its direction. You need to cast a large net to identify many potential stakeholders. Then you can focus down and decide who can best represent the needs of each stakeholder group and how the team will engage with them. Every project faces many requirements related decisions. These include resolving conflicts both within and across user classes, prioritizing requirements, evaluating proposed requirement changes, and many more. So I think it's important to determine who the decision makers will be for these requirements issues, preferably before they confront their first significant decision. And each group also needs to choose a decision rule to apply when they're resolving issues. So let's take a closer look at practice two, define business objectives. Um, just doing a little adjustments here. Okay. So understanding the business problem or the opportunity is an essential first step toward product and project success. You don't want to end up in a situation where you've achieved project success, but product failure. So the next step is to describe exactly what the project sponsor or other important stakeholders expect the solution to accomplish, the business objectives. Business objectives can be financial or non-financial, internal like operations, or outward facing like products. They can be strategic or tactical. It's also a good idea to identify some success metrics so you can tell if you have achieved or look to be on the path to achieving these objectives. So these are business-oriented requirements, which can ultimately lead to defining a solution concept that you're confident will satisfy those business objectives, along with the scope and limitations that bound the solution. It's very helpful to define not just what the solution will do, but also what it won't do. One of my consulting clients did a really good job of this once. Uh, they were in New Zealand, actually, and they were building this website to support a, a national sports team. And they had a very nice list of um, exclusions, things that someone might expect they could do at this website, but we're not going to be part of the solution. And I think drawing those boundaries is really important. So uh, ultimately then we get all this information that's going to let us elicit the detailed requirements that describe the solutions capabilities and characteristics. So having a clear set of business objectives helps the team to identify those key stakeholders who will work with the BA to understand their needs and to define all the necessary solution functionality. You can have the appropriate decision maker set the priorities of individual requirements. And from that, you can define the contents of each development increment or product release to align with achieving the most important and most timely business objectives. That's what priorities are all about. So business objectives let you determine when the business problem is solved or the need is fulfilled or the opportunity is exploited. And, and if you don't define them, I'm not sure how you tell that. So while it's easier to state vague goals, I think it's a better idea to write your objectives to be specific, quantitative, and measurable. Otherwise, how do you tell if you've achieved them? I don't know. So here's a tool that might help. A business objectives model. We're going to talk a lot about models, actually. 
A business objectives model is a valuable tool for a thorough analysis for complex problems in which multiple business problems and business objectives are all intertwined. So the business objectives model visually links problems to objectives and to their associated success metrics and to the resultant solution concept. So here's a partial example for a proposed restaurant online ordering system. Our first business problem says, hmm, the revenue that we're getting from a particular target market is lower than we'd like. And we say, okay, well, what would we like it to be? What, would, what sort of an outcome are we hoping for? Our first corresponding business objective then is to increase the monthly revenue from the target market to some specific value. And you'll notice that by having specific numbers in these kinds of uh, objectives, you've automatically got a way to measure whether you're moving in that direction. So, you know, so those are success metrics built right in. And as we think through the restaurant's business situation, we're probably going to uncover some additional problems and corresponding business objectives. And, and this is just an example, but I, I think it could probably apply to a lot of situations. Um, and it's based on having some numbers, something that you can say, hmm, here's where we are. I don't like that. We'd like to be somewhere else. Where would we like to be? And then we can lead to this through this analysis to conceive a solution that would hopefully address those problems and with any luck, achieve our desired business outcomes. So you can see how to tie specific major solution features back to individual business objectives. So I think doing this kind of an analysis is much better than thinking of a cool looking solution first and hoping it will give you the business outcomes you desire. That's kind of funny. Um, I have a friend who I, I know through wine tasting stuff. Wine tasting is my favorite thing to do. And um, she had a great idea for a phone app uh, related to food, coincidentally. And I think it was a good idea. It's quite innovative. And she was very excited about it. And I shared some of the chapters of this book, including this one, uh, where this is covered, uh, with her because uh, even before it was published, because I thought they might be helpful to her. So she was diving into working with a developer to build some prototypes. And, and she showed me that at one point when we crossed paths again a few months later. So it was coming along, but she still hadn't looked at this stuff. I'm thinking, well, how, how do you know when you're done? How do you know what you're trying to accomplish unless you've thought through some of this? And it shouldn't take very long to do this. I think it's a small investment in making sure we are all pointing in the same direction. Um, so I'm a big fan of these sorts of foundational laying things. So let's move on to say a few words about requirement solicitation. The first step in dealing re with requirements is to get some. People often speak of gathering requirements, but I don't like that term and I try to avoid it. It's not just a simple collection process. A better term for this activity is requirements elicitation. Elicitation includes collection, yes, but it also involves requirements exploration, discovery, and even invention. Requirements can come from many sources. The BA needs to look for requirements from diverse user representatives, subject matter experts and other stakeholders, uh, documentation about business processes, perhaps current systems or competing products, applicable laws and business policies, user problem reports. There's lots of places where you might find information that helps you determine what should our solution do. And the skilled BA has many elicitation techniques in their toolkit to do this. Some of them are interviews, scaling that up to facilitated group workshops. Observing users at work can be pretty insightful. You can do surveys and questionnaires, process modeling, and so on. There are a lot of places and a lot of ways to look for requirements. So here are four core elicitation practices. On the next slide, we'll discuss understanding what users need to do with the solution. And if you take away only one thing from this presentation, this is the one I'd take away. All systems react to various kinds of events that trigger some response. There can be business events that launch a use case, signal events like inputs from a switch or a sensor or some data value that happens in your world, and temporal or time-triggered events that lead to some system behavior. So that's a good technique for many systems, uh, kinds of uh, elicitation and analysis. All software systems process data. So you must assess data concepts and their relationships. Data modeling is a powerful technique for this purpose. 
And actually just today, both on my LinkedIn account and on my medium.com account, uh, I posted an article that Candace and I wrote adapted from the book uh, that's, I believe it's titled, Has Anyone Seen My Data? Which is about exactly this topic. And besides functionality, for every product, you need to explore quality attributes, which are a category of non-functional requirements. And this is important because there are often trade-offs between these quality characteristics. So you cannot optimize all of them at once. So that's another very important, but sometimes uh, overlooked part of the elicitation activities. Now, if you were holding a requirements elicitation discussion with some users, like the one shown here, about some new information system, which of these questions do you think would yield the greatest insights? What do you want? Or what are your requirements? Or what do you want the system to do? Or what features would you like to see in the system? Or, and this is what I like, what do you need to do with the solution? Uh, that's my preferred question. And what that does is it shifts the discussion from a focus on the product to a focus on users and more specifically on usage. People sometimes talk about user-centered design or user-centered requirements or something. And, and I'm much more interested in usage-centered or usage-centric approaches. Now, focusing on features during elicitation, which I think is very common, can lead the team to implement incomplete functionality that doesn't let users do all the things they must do. Okay, we've got some stuff there, but we're missing some stuff. The IIBA talks about stakeholder requirements. You know, there's this three level model of um, requirements, business requirements, stakeholder requirements, solution requirements. And that's rather patterned after a three level model that I came up with about 25 years ago. But I don't like the term stakeholder requirements because as far as I can tell, it seems like all requirements come from some stakeholder. So I prefer to talk specifically about requirements from that subset of stakeholders who will actually use the solution in some way. So that's why I talk about user requirements. What we wanna do is make sure our user requirements align with achieving the project's business objectives. And of course, that means you need to define those business objectives first, as we saw a few minutes ago. People very naturally focus on describing the way the system's gonna function when everything goes fine, sometimes called the happy path. But in addition to exploring these normal success scenarios, you also need to consider alternative ways the user might try to accomplish a task, as well as exceptions that could potentially prevent successful completion. From the user requirements, the BA then can identify the necessary functionality the solution must include to let users get the job done. And by making sure that the specified functionality aligns with known user tasks, you're less likely to waste time and effort implementing functionality that seems like a good idea, but then goes unused. In fact, I think there's, uh, there are studies that have been done that, that look at like what percentage of functionality in major applications rarely or never get used. And it's quite horrifying, you know, something like 50 to 80%, depending on the study of the, of the functionality just doesn't get much usage. So you might've had that experience of implementing functionality that seemed like a good idea at the time and somebody thought they needed it, but then it just basically didn't get used. That's frustrating because you spent just about enough or just about the same amount of effort on the parts that uh, don't get used as the ones that did. You worked just as hard at making those right. I think the usage-centric approach really cuts down on, on this problem. Hey, Carl. Mm -hmm. Got a question that came in in the chat. Okay. Question is, do you have anecdotal stories about when stakeholder analysis was missed on a project? Well, I don't have any personal stories. I suspect pretty much everybody listening uh, has one, and I'd be delighted to hear what their own experiences were. Uh, but what can happen is if you overlook a significant stakeholder class uh, early on and they don't get engaged in the project, uh, then what's likely to happen is that you're going to have some, you know, when, when those people eventually come to the surface, they're likely to be presenting some requirements and more scarily, some constraints that we didn't know about. And now we have to adapt to and work around and patch in somehow. And that's, I think, the, uh, the risk that we're trying to manage here. Uh, so I, I guess I haven't 
really run into that myself because I've usually tried to do a, a pretty good job of that. But if anybody else has an uh, experience story to share, uh, let, let's have them throw that into the chat. Did I dodge that well enough, Mike? Well, let's talk about a couple of commonly used techniques for exploring user requirements, use cases, and user stories. It can be a bit challenging to steer elicitation participants from thinking about product features to focusing on usage, but use cases provide a nicely structured way to facilitate that change in the thought process. The name of a use case defines the goal the user is trying to accomplish. So maybe we're talking about an application in which people can um, you know, publish uh, articles or that they write online in some sort of you know shared blog or publication platform. And one thing an author might want to do there is to view their article statistics. I do that myself. I'm sure all of us who write are interested in that information. So that becomes a use case name. Whenever an elicitation participant says, I want to do something or I need to be able to do something, the do something likely is a use case. So a good use case template contains categories to fully describe the use case, including things like preconditions that must be satisfied before the system could execute the use case, post conditions that are true after successful completion, the steps that take place in a dialogue between the user and the system, how to handle things that go wrong, pertinent business rules, and so forth. And the BA can then derive all the necessary functional requirements that the developers must implement to realize the use case. Developers don't implement business requirements. They don't implement user requirements. They implement little bits of functionality that in the aggregate let people do the things they need to do and hopefully align with achieving our desired business outcomes. Also something that was not obvious to me the first time I started using use cases was that testers can create tests from the use case specification as well. And this is a really powerful quality aid. We're gonna come back to testing requirements a little bit later. I'm sorry to have to keep giving you forward references to things that we will talk about later, but I've been doing presentations for a long time and I've never learned how to say everything simultaneously. So we'll get there. Carl, speaking of forward references, uh -huh. another question in the chat. Okay. How much emphasis on current state or more narrowly current state process documentation do you recommend? presumably upstream from requirements like future state? Well, the answer to that question is the same as the answer to most questions, which is it depends. You know, I can't, I can't measure how much emphasis because I don't know what kind of product we're trying to build or why, but I think understanding business objectives would let you know how much uh, analysis we have to do of our current state, you know, whether it's a fully manual process we're automating or whether it's a completely innovative product that no one's ever seen before. So there is really a current state perhaps. So I don't have any way to uh, answer that globally, um, but you know, it depends. I, I'd like to be able to give you the correct answer, which is, oh, well, 75% emphasis, but <laughs> you know, there, there is just no correct answer to, to questions like that, unfortunately. Um, so where were we here? Okay, uh, so user stories are typically employed on agile projects as the primary requirements deliverable. And a user story is written according to a pattern that provides a little more information and context than a simple use case statement, including the type of user or, or and the uh, motivation or rationale behind that requested user requirement. So for the same need, uh, and we might write a user story that says, as an author, so now we know who is interested in this, I want to view the statistics for my articles so that I can see which topics my readers enjoy the most. And uh, this gives us a little more richer understanding of why viewing article statistics is desirable for some particular community. Now, writing rather than writing detailed functional requirements, agile projects typically provide the story details through a set of acceptance criteria that the implemented story must satisfy. And one thing I found is that requirements and tests are complementary thought processes, uh, showing the same information in different ways. And in fact, I have a strong feeling that there is no such thing as agile requirements. I do not like seeing that term because it implies that uh, requirements on agile projects are somehow different from requirements on other, every other project. And I don't believe that's true. 
uh, my feeling is that the developers need the same information to build the correct product properly, regardless of what development lifecycle they're following. You still need that same knowledge. And so uh, you can call it different stuff. You can write it in various levels of detail and different people can come up with it, but you need the same information. And really, if you look at it as tests or if you look at it as requirements, you're conveying that same information, but from two different perspectives. But either approach can work fine. And with both use cases and user stories, I think the key to success is to keep the focus on understanding user goals, not on describing little bits of system functionality. So somebody asked me once, um, you know, what's the most important thing you've learned, the most important lesson you've learned about software development in your career? And that was, that was it basically, is to focus requirements, understanding on usage, not on products or features. I think that's the most important thing that I've learned. And I found that that's a far more effective way to approach requirements than asking people some variant of uh, what do you want or what are your, your requirements? So let's move on to requirements analysis. Once you've elicited some requirements, you need to analyze them. But what exactly does it mean to analyze requirements? Analysis kind of sounds like something that just happens somehow if you stare at the requirements long enough. Um, and in fact, I've been a little surprised that some of the requirements books I've read uh, don't even have requirements analysis listed in the index, which strikes me as odd. So analysis, uh, you can really use several techniques very specifically to search for particular problems and produce better requirements and hopefully better solutions. And I think analyzing requirements is where a skilled BA really adds value. Analysis is an incremental and iterative process. It's interwoven with the ongoing requirements elicitation, specification, and validation activities. So the point of analysis is to make sure that the needs of all the stakeholders are understood and documented appropriately. And the outcome of successful analysis ensures that we could define, agree upon, build and test a satisfactory solution to meet those needs. So analysis involves multiple thought processes to confirm completeness, clarity and correctness. You ask questions to make sure you understand what each requirement is saying. Sometimes analysis involves detailing requirements to an appropriate level. And again, appropriate is, well, it depends, you know, it depends on many factors, how, how detailed they need to be. You can compare multiple representations of information to spot errors and to fill in any knowledge gaps. And along the way, you confirm and refine your knowledge. So there are four essential requirements analysis practices. First is obvious, simply to an analyze both individual requirements and sets of requirements. I'll discuss this further in just a moment. Drawing visual diagrams or models of requirements is an especially powerful technique. Uh, I've been a fan of requirements modeling for many years. In about 1986, I took a class called Jordan Structured Analysis and Design. And that just totally changed how I thought about software development. I never really thought about the idea of drawing a bunch of pictures um, to, to understand what you're getting into and what you're imagining a solution to be before you started building it. So I've been a huge fan of modeling for a long time. People often create prototypes, which are partial or preliminary or, or possible implementations to help you better understand the problem and to refine and validate requirements for some part of the solution. Also, since no team can implement all of its requirements simultaneously, they must prioritize them to make sure the team delivers the most important capabilities in the right sequence to maximize the delivered value. I see we've got a couple of questions here about user stories. And at this point, I'd like to defer uh, exploring those questions just to make sure we can get through everything else here. I'm not sure how many questions we might have coming in over the evening. So um, if you don't mind, I'll hold off on those and, and uh, we'll have plenty of time. I've got the rest of the evening available so we can talk as long as people want to uh, at the end here, but I wanna make sure that everybody gets a chance to um, hear about uh, you know, the, the main story. Yeah, just let me know when you're ready, Carl. Okay, we'll will do. Thanks very much. 
Um, so here are the major aspects, I think, of analyzing individual requirements. You should be able to trace each requirement or user story back to its origin. That could be a stakeholder request, a policy, a quality attribute, or some other source that led to including it. So if anyone asks why a particular requirement is present, the BA should have a compelling answer. I'm a big fan, or I'm sorry, a big aspect of uh, analysis is to decompose large or high level requirements into this sufficient level of detail. And related to that analysis also includes deriving functional requirements from the various bits of a use case or a story from business rules or from other sources. Developers write a lot of code to handle exceptions that could prevent successful execution. So during analysis, you need to identify potential error conditions, including user actions or system conditions or data values that the system has to detect and handle. Experienced BAs automatically scan for certain characteristics as they review requirements. They should be correct, complete, feasible, unambiguous, and so forth. We've all seen those kinds of lists. Now, you're never going to get perfect requirements, but if you keep those characteristics in mind as you write and review them, you'll certainly get better requirements. Consider how someone could judge whether the requirement was correctly implemented and ready for use. It's acceptance criteria. People often make unstated assumptions regarding requirements and conflicting or uh, obsolete assumptions can cause problems later on. Constraints restrict the developer's design or implementation options. So as a BA, you want to look for constraints that are embedded in the requirements and confirm whether those are truly restrictions or they're just solution ideas that someone has proposed and maybe aren't uh, really truly requirements. Business rules often influence or serve as the source of specific pieces of functionality or data. And it's important to know which rules apply to which processes, functions, and data objects. We're going to come back to business rules later as well. Products that pose safety risks must include hazard analysis as part of their requirements analysis. And think about the risks that any requirement could pose to the project's success. Finally, requirements reuse involves both crafting requirements that can be reused in other contexts, as well as finding existing functionality that your application could exploit. So consider both of those reuse aspects during analysis. So there's a lot of stuff to look for here. Um, and as you do this, a lot of this, as many of you I no doubt already have and probably do pretty much every day, you internalize a lot of these activities and you just know what to do and what to look for. But in the meantime, it's helpful to have checklists of these. So from the uh, software Rex, R -E -Q -S, dot com website for the book, uh, you can download checklists of these kinds of things. There's a lot of checklists there that I find checklists really helpful. So they're just handy reminders. Now, other aspects of analysis look at sets of requirements. It's hard to see the requirements that aren't there because they're invisible. So finding missing requirements involves reading between the lines. One way to assess completeness is to, to trace downward from your business objectives through to your solution requirements to make sure that everything aligns properly. Inconsistencies can arise between a parent requirement and its children. Requirements of the same type can also conflict. One says to do A, another says to do B, but it's logically impossible to do both. Look for multiple instances of the same information I once reviewed several use cases for a client that had nearly, but not exactly, the same data structure definition in three use cases. Now, the reader doesn't know which one of those, if any, to believe. So replication also raises the risk of generating an inconsistency if one of those instances gets changed, but other ones that are duplicates of it do not. I think it's better to point to a single source of the information instead of duplicating it in most cases. Some requirements depend on others being implemented at the same time or previously. For instance, it only makes sense to implement exception handling code concurrently with the functionality where the error could occur. So beyond the desirable characteristics like completeness and consistency I mentioned earlier, be sure that groups of requirements are written and labeled in a way to be modifiable and traceable as part of your quality assessment. 
When you create multiple representations of requirements using different thought processes, then you can compare them and find problems. This is a really powerful uh, benefit of modeling. You have multiple representations like text, um, diagrams, maybe you have a table, maybe you have uh, tests, maybe you have a prototype, you're representing knowledge in different ways through different thought processes and comparing those often finds disconnects. That's really valuable. And it's a whole lot cheaper than finding those same problems in the delivered solution. Earlier, I mentioned the importance of prioritizing requirements and really prioritization is, is uh, relative. You know, okay. One requirement doesn't have a priority only with respect to others. Stakeholders sometimes uh, assume that a solution will include certain functionality without them having to say so explicitly. But I have found that telepathy and clairvoyance are not effective requirements elicitation tools. So we're better off not using those. So these analysis techniques will become second nature eventually as you just get in the habit of, um, of uh, using them and, and applying them. Um, so I see a question here, how, how BA risks as part of the requirements analysis process should be considered and analyzed. What techniques would you suggest to use? So I mean, we can talk about that for a minute. Um, there are all sorts of requirements related risks. And what I would suggest that uh, teams do is first of all, do formal risk management on your projects, always. Uh, some people have said that risk management is project management. Uh, so I think risk management should be important on, for any project. It's something that should be assigned to people. They have to have responsibility for identifying risks, evaluating them, selecting mitigation strategies, and being responsible for implementing those mitigation strategies and seeing how well they work. And uh, a part of that is requirements-related risks. There are some sort of generic ones like missing a stakeholder. <laughs> uh, came up earlier, you know, if you overlook a stakeholder, that certainly is a risk that you have to be concerned about. And then you ask yourself, well, how can we avoid overlooking stakeholders and take appropriate actions? Um, and another thing to keep in mind here with risks is that it's not something you just do and then move on. It's an ongoing part of your project, just as uh, everything else you do by daily or weekly tracking to uh, monitor how we're coming along and make sure we're still on track. So uh, I'm glad somebody brought up the idea of risk because risk management is something that I've uh, felt strongly about for a long time. You're not gonna think of everything, but it might save you some pain. And I'm a big fan of avoiding pain. So the term requirements specification refers both to the recording of requirements knowledge and to the deliverables you produce, such as a software requirements specification. And we see one of the world's earliest BAs down here diligently writing requirements. Actually, I think that's um, Charles Dickens, but uh, close enough. Now, whenever you see the phrase or hear it, writing requirements, please mentally change that to representing requirements knowledge. Natural language text is the most popular way to record software requirements because it's how people normally communicate. But there are many alternatives, including tables, visual models, tests, screen designs, prototypes, decision tables, mathematical expressions, a lot of ways to represent requirements knowledge. Now, some people don't like to write requirements. We don't have time to do that. We don't need to do that. But my feeling is that the cost of recording knowledge is small compared to the cost of acquiring that knowledge or reacquiring it in the future if it wasn't recorded. Human memories are imperfect and incomplete. They fade and distort over time, and other people can't access our memories. Documented requirements, even if they're not perfect, constitute a persistent group memory. Have you ever had a conversation with somebody about requirements or anything else, such as where to meet for dinner? And you walked away from that, and you both had different understandings of what was decided or different recollections of it later on when, when you don't bump into each other at the same restaurant? Well, memories simply aren't perfect. So if we at least write things down, we've got something to go back to and look at. Now, requirements can be stored in many structures. I often talk about a document, and that's a common form of container, but really they're just containers. 
They could be documents or spreadsheets or a database, uh, a requirements management tool, stickies on a wall, whatever works for you. These different structures vary in the information they contain, how that information is organized, how much detail is included and so forth. So just think of your requirements spec as being a container for requirements related knowledge, no matter what form you select. It's important also to remember that the goal of writing any kind of requirements is always clear and effective communication. And there are many ways to achieve that without being dogmatic. So two core requirement specification practices are to write requirements in consistent ways, depending on what kind of information they are, you know, use patterns, and to organize that information in a structured fashion with the help of a template. Coming up next, we will talk a little bit about the importance of identifying and documenting business rules. And it's a good idea to create a glossary because a common vocabulary helps the participants avoid misunderstandings. So every project should have a glossary of significant terms, abbreviations, acronyms, and synonyms to make sure that everyone understands them in the same way. You know, I've, I've seen places where people had multiple terms for the same object, or they used the same name for to mean multiple things. And that's an invitation to confusion unless there's a place that people can go to really find out what all those things mean. My friend Jeremy visited his local blood bank's website a little while ago, and he made an appointment to donate blood later that day. Good for Jeremy. However, when Jeremy arrived at the blood bank, the staff told him, well, we don't take same day appointments, even though the website let him make a same day appointment. So Jeremy was annoyed. Business rules are statements that define or restrict certain aspects of an organization's operations or they influence the behaviors of people and systems within the organization. Though they're not software requirements themselves, business rules often lead to derived requirements to enforce or comply with the rule. And as such, they're a critical piece of the requirements puzzle on every project. The blood bank's website builders dropped the ball on that issue by not knowing about or enforcing this no same day appointment policy. There are several types of business rules. Some simply state facts about the business. Many rules impose constraints on who can do what under what conditions. Action enablers trigger some system or business behavior. Computations describe how certain calculations are performed. Business rules come from various sources. Company policies constitute a large source like a store's policies for issuing refunds. Many systems must comply with various laws and regulations, and industry standards, such as interface standards, are another major source. Unfortunately, too often, the business rules are not documented at all, or they're embedded in code. Maybe they just exist as uh, you know, traditional tribal folklore around the campfire or something. But I think it's better to document business rules like you document requirements. They should be clear, complete, consistent, unambiguous, and all those other good things. Business rules are also subject to the same problems that can afflict requirements. One rule could conflict or overlap with another. A rule might be obsolete or based on assumptions that are no longer valid. Rules could be imprecise or fail to cover certain conditions. And as with the requirements, textual rules are not always the best way to communicate information. Let me show you an example. Suppose your online store offers various combinations of discounts and free shipping, depending on the total price of an order and whether the customer is a club member. Now you could write out all those rules in natural language, but displaying them in the form of a decision table like this is easier to understand. The decision table shows all the possible combinations of various conditions and the resulting actions that would take place um, so here we have two sets of conditions. One depends on the order total, and we've got these various ranges. The other is the question of whether someone is a club member or not, the customer is a club member. And these lead to various actions shown down below, which can be combined. So for example, let's look at rule discount five. Always a good idea to name these things. It states that if the order total is in the range of 50 to $100 inclusive, 
And uh, that helps to say inclusive when you're thinking of ranges and the customer is a club member, then they get a 10% discount and they get free shipping, okay? So representing business logic with decision tables helps to avoid boundary value problems, helps to avoid missing logical combinations. This kind of compact table format is easier to create and read and modify than having a long repetitive set of very similar rules where not only do you glaze over when you try to read them, uh, but you can have a hard time finding the information you need and telling if they're all correct. Um, the decision table also facilitates test design to ensure that no condition combinations are missed. So decision table is one of my favorite uh, BA tools and I hope all of you are, are uh, having that in your toolkit. All right, so by this point in the requirements development process, you understand the project's business objectives. You've elicited information for some portion of the solution from various stakeholders. You've analyzed them and recorded those requirements in appropriate forms. So the team's now ready to begin development on that portion of the product, right? Maybe. Yes, you have some requirements, but how do you know they're the right requirements? Are you confident they'll meet the user's goals? and address the business situation that led to launching the initiative in the first place. You could have a set of beautifully written and modeled requirements that appear to be crystal clear, complete, and unambiguous, and yet they could still be wrong. So requirements validation activities strive to confirm that some set of requirements accurately describes, describes stakeholder needs and to confirm that a solution based on those requirements would indeed satisfy those needs and achieve the desired business objectives. The terms verification and validation are often uh, confused or misused. Verification confirms that whatever you've done was done correctly and to specification. Validation ensures that you're doing the right thing. So requirements validation activities like analysis are interwoven with the other ongoing requirements solicitation, analysis, and specification work. So how do we do validation? Well, prototypes and early releases of your solution or even delivering the full solution, those are ways to validate with customers whether or not you're building the correct solution. But those can be kind of expensive activities and you don't get much feedback until you've, after you've actually built something. So a core practice for ongoing requirements validation involves a combination of reviewing requirements and testing them even before you have any code. So I've been um, a fan of peer reviews for a long time. I'm such a fan that I wrote a book on it quite a while ago. And uh, peer review of documented requirements is a really powerful quality practice. In a peer review, colleagues of the person who created a requirements artifact, whatever it is, examine it for potential defects and other issues. Reviews are a high leverage investment in software quality and requirements reviews offer the highest leverage of all. You do need to choose the right review participants. A BA might invite another analyst to review their requirements because the other BA knows what kind of requirement problems to look for. However, that other BA can't tell if the requirements properly address the business need. I've run into this myself. One of my consulting services that I've provided is to review requirements deliverables for clients. And I don't have all the background all the time, you know, to understand the business objectives and everything. And so it's hard for me to tell if they're the right requirements, but I can find a lot of potential problems even without knowing that. But I can't validate the requirements. To validate them, you also need representatives of um, people like the reviewers who supp supplied the information that led to the requirements. Those could be uh, representatives of various user classes, marketing staff for a commercial product, and the author of any higher level or predecessor system specification if there is one. People who have to base their work on the requirements, I call them victims of the requirements, they also make good reviewers. Architects, designers, data analysts, developers, testers, they're all going to find different kinds of issues. There are several forms of reviews that span a range of formality and rigor 
The simplest, an ad hoc review, just involves asking a colleague to look over something you've created. In a pass around, you invite several people to examine some requirements or diagrams and comment. A team review and an inspection involve a meeting. They're more structured, they're more formal. That makes them slower and more expensive, but they're also more thorough and more valuable. Reviewers can use a checklist to remind them of common types of requirements problems to look for, like these, the usual offenders, ambiguities, inconsistencies, and so forth. Uh, again, with experience, you'll internalize this list, but in the meantime, a checklist is helpful, and you can download a requirements review checklist from the website for our book. You can begin testing your software as soon as you define your first requirement. This truth was a real eye opener for me when I first realized it. Requirements describe what to build and how the solution should behave in various conditions. Tests describe how to tell if the solution is exhibiting the correct behavior and to find situations where it is not. Long ago, as I mentioned earlier, I discovered that writing tests from my mental image of how the system should behave is a different complementary thought process than writing requirements. But having both representations was useful because I would write some requirements from my understanding, whatever input I got from various sources. I would then write tests immediately, and I would walk through those tests, mapping them against the requirements to make sure that every test could be performed by firing off certain requirements. And every time I did that, I found errors. I found missing or erroneous requirements. I found missing or erroneous tests. And when do you want to find and fix those things? After you've delivered the, pro the solution or while you're still just kind of kicking stuff around? Earlier is better than later. And it's even better if you can use two entirely separate brains to write the requirements and the tests starting from the same information. That's a really good way to discover ambiguities in the form of, uh, or gaps or that sort of things, common problems. So agile teams often write acceptance criteria in the form of acceptance tests to define a user story's details. So those tests help developers understand what to implement and how to tell if they're done. The tests also help users envision whether a story will meet their needs because they can imagine walking through the, the steps involved in a test and say, yeah, I can see how this would work. And that's the essence of requirements validation is to find out if that's going to be what they have in mind. A popular way to write acceptance tests uses the given when then pattern. So think back to the user story we saw earlier. As an author, I want to view the statistics for my articles so that I can see which topics my readers enjoy the most. Here's one acceptance test for that story. I've given it a, a, a label. Then given that I'm logged into the platform and I have articles published, when I request to view statistics, you notice we haven't said when you click on this or whatever, we're trying to make these independent of implementation specifics. Then a graph of my total article view statistics in the past 30 days is displayed and blah, 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 whatever's supposed to happen. So this is a nice pattern to follow for um, you know, collecting this information to visualize how the system ought to function under certain conditions. Here's another way you can use test thinking to validate your requirements before writing any code. Suppose you've drawn a model to complement some of your textual requirements. You can trace the logical execution, execution in quotes, execution path on the model with a highlighter pen as you walk through the tests to see if the system would behave as you imagine. And after you go through all the tests with your highlighter, you look for problems. If there's a path in the model that isn't highlighted, that could either mean that you're missing a test for that path, or it could mean that that path does not reflect a legitimate system behavior. Conversely, if a test has no corresponding path to trace in the model, either the test is invalid or the model's incomplete. And either way, the fact that you found a disconnect tells you there's a problem. Here's an example. This is a portion of a process flow diagram for a website that lets sales representatives enter orders for a customer who's on the phone. And in one scenario, the customer's requested items are all out of stock. Yeah, okay, so we'll be following this path. It's in stock? No. 
Okay, sorry. Do you want something else? No. All right. Well, we're all we all finished it all because um, everything's out of stock. So among many others, the tester has written this test. Given that the cart is empty, when the customer declines to order more items, then the process terminates. So let's try to trace the path this test describes on the process flow, and you can't do it. You can't get to the end process. This diagram says that if the requested items are not in stock and the customer doesn't want to order anything else, so the cart's still empty, the sales rep still sends an empty quote to the customer. That doesn't match the test and it doesn't make sense. So assuming the test is correct, see something has to be correct, then we found an error in the model and in any textual requirements that go along with that model. So what do you do? Well, armed with that knowledge about an error in the diagram, the BA redraws that portion of the process model to look like this. We've added this blue diamond, which now checks to see if the cart contains items following that conversation between the customer and the sales rep. If so, it sends the quote. If not, we end. So let's see how that works with our test now. Same test. Given that the cart is empty, and when the customer says, uh, I'm all done ordering, I don't want anything else, now we can get to the end process. Okay, so I think this is really good. You know, finding errors like this before the team writes the code and before the customer encounters a problem is a good thing. You might have noticed that customers are never in a good mood when they encounter a problem. So let's try to minimize that. So far, I've described 18 practices that help you develop a set of high quality solution requirements. Once you have those fine requirements in hand, now what happens to them? Requirements management is the subdomain of requirements engineering that deals with how requirements are used on the project and how the project responds to evolving needs. Requirements management involves several ongoing activities. You need to track versions of individual requirements as they change over time. Similarly, the status of each individual requirement changes over time as it goes from being um, proposed to approved to ultimately being either verified as correctly implemented in the product or deferred or deleted. So we wanna see how each requirement's coming along that path. If you're serious about requirements management, you'll trace each one both backward to its origin and forward to design elements, code, and tests that show where it was implemented in the solution. So these are all valuable things to do, but the two most important requirements management practices that apply to every project are establishing and, and managing requirements baselines and managing changes to requirements effectively. You need to have mechanisms in place to add new requirements that come along, to modify existing ones, and to delete planned requirements from your backlog of pending work. So as the BA, you've developed a set of requirements and confirmed that they describe a suitable solution. So the next step is for the development team to commit to implementing a subset of those requirements in a specific time frame or development cycle. That's a requirements baseline. It's just an agreement. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about this practice. Now establishing a baseline doesn't mean that change won't happen. It will. However, a baseline assures everyone involved that the team can move forward with, with development at a low risk of major changes. A sensible baselining and change approach ensures that everyone always knows what they should and should not be working on. You can define a baseline in two ways. A time-bound baseline begins by establishing a time box. That could be a single iteration or a group of iterations, a planned release, or even the entire product. The team then allocates the highest priority requirements from their backlog to that baseline until the time boxes development and testing capacities are filled. In contrast, a scope bound baseline consists of a logically grouped set of features, requirements, or stories that can be built, tested, and deployed together, and they're approved as a unit. With a scope bound approach, the requirements baseline is established without necessarily knowing its size or delivery schedule. So a baseline serves as the reference point for commencing change control of the committed requirements. Your team should follow its defined requirements change process to make sure the right people make the right decisions. And nobody likes this part, 
but this often requires negotiating changes in scope, time, and resources for that chunk of work. One way you can help deal with these things is to include contingency buffers to provide some slack time to accommodate a reasonable amount of change. Otherwise, if you don't have any slack, the first new or changed requirement that comes along or any other project surprises can disrupt those plans and commitments. So we've covered a lot of ground quickly here today. I hope you've made some notes of practices that you feel would add value to your project that might reduce risk, might increase the chance of success. I cannot promise you that if you perform all these 20 practices on your projects, you'll definitely be successful, but I can promise that you'll have fewer requirements related headaches if you do. To me, that seems like a strong enough motivation to look into them and see if these practices would help your teams beef up how they plan, develop, and manage their requirements. And I have one more slide here. Um, if you think this sounds interesting, then you can actually get a 35% discount on the book in either print version or ebook version from the publisher. The publisher is Addison Wesley, which is part of Pearson uh, Education. And their website is informit.com. So if you go to the URL shown here and put code software Rex in the uh, for discount code when you're checking out, you can get a 35% discount. So hopefully that would be interesting. So I will come back live, although not in person and see if we have any more questions or comments to go through. <laughs>